I am really excited to be here at Cross Life. As earlier stated, I am Rick Pugh. I served here, I had the privilege of serving here uh, years ago as the college and singles pastor. My wife and I, we were able to be here for seven years, and then God called me to be a lead pastor, and we moved over to the Windermere area and then to the Mount Dora Eustis area. I was really amazed at the first hour because we had a lot of our friends from previous churches here, and uh, it was kind of almost like a, a family get-together, and there's more in this service too. So thanks, everybody, for making time to be here and, and just be with our family, and we love all of you very much. I kind of want to get right into the talk this morning. I, I had this really cheesy, I'll go ahead. Y'all, can you handle a cheesy, corny joke real quick? Okay, now listen, you got to know as a pastor, I'm the kind of guy that I have to talk to a crowd. If you all don't talk back to me, I will fall asleep, and it's really embarrassing to see a grown man pass out on the stage, okay? <clears throat> okay, all right. So I'm making, you know, Pastor Dwayne said you guys were sharp and awake and alive, way more so than the first hour. All right, very good. Now we're going. So listen, I was here when Barry Edwards came here in view of a call as the children's minister. Now here's what was funny. When he came in, everybody know Barry Edwards, right? Minister of children. Okay, good. Just making sure. And when he came, as only Barry could do, it's one of the great memories I have of being here. And, you know, I don't know why Pastor Dwayne even hired me as a college and singles pastor because I'm about as hyperactive and ADHD as they come. But I remember weird things. And I remember Barry Edwards, when he came in, the first time he spoke in front of the big church group, he just kind of said, well, <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all with the official Arkansas greeting. Nice tooth. <laughs> That's all he said, nice tooth. I'm sitting there busting out laughing. Some of the other people are like, oh, I don't know about this guy. He'll be great with children. Give him to the children. Hey, listen, I want to talk to you today about this hope. Overcoming life's toughest obstacles. I know there are four different types of people in this room today. There are some people in this room, you came here because someone told you you are going to church. You're going to church. We're getting close to Easter. you got to know what they're talking about. You don't want to be embarrassed. If the pastor there says, if you're a Christer, stand up. That's Christmas and Easter church attenders. So we're going to church today. And you're trying to figure out this whole church thing. You're not really sure about God and, and what all this stuff is about. And then there are people in this room that are getting ready to go into, uh, I would say, a tough obstacle of some kind. You know it's coming. There are some in this room today or watching online or watching on Channel 45, the Good Life channel, and you're already in it. That's why you're on this channel. Don't turn the channel. There are others that have just come out of it, and you're like wiping your brow saying, thank you, Jesus, for getting me through that. I'm wanting you to know that today I am, I am a hope representative. Because I would submit to you that a lot of people in this room today may not have a faith problem. In other words, let me qualify that. If you have come to a place where you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've had one of those moments in your life where you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior, you've confessed your sins, you've invited him into your life, you're saved. Once saved, always saved. If saved, whatever, whatever line you want to use, nothing can steal that faith away from you. But if I were the enemy, and I knew I couldn't take your faith away from you, what would I do? I would try to beat you down through life. What is life? Life is this. Life is a series of emotions and, and actions and reactions to actions and all these things. Life is life. And we go through life, and it beats us down because nothing will hit harder than life. And all of a sudden, we get to a place where we're kind of saying to ourselves, I'm just not feeling it. I mean, if I'm going to be honest, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be truthful, I'm just not feeling it. And so when we get ready to celebrate Easter here in two weeks, we should be so pumped up about Easter coming because that's when Jesus settled everything and made it possible for us to become children of the living God. Now, if I can't get an amen out of that from this crowd, I'm in real trouble. Can I at least get an amen for that? All right, good. Now you're talking back to me. I'm telling you, I'll fall asleep on y'all. And if I see you fall asleep, I'm coming out to you and I'm going to sneak up to you. I'm looking right now. I'm finding one. Let me see if I can find somebody there. No, you're all awake. That's good. But there are all kinds of problems in life. Think about this for just a moment. It, what would the enemy do in a storm of life? All of us here have a story. That's one of the things I love about people. If you sit down and talk to someone long enough, you're going to hear their story. And everybody's going through something. You might see a pastor, you might see a speaker, you might see somebody and think, oh man, they've got it all together. No. 
You know how I know that's not true? Because that's not the human condition. Study sociology for a while, you'll realize everybody has something going on. In fact, crises of life, that's the great catalyst that God uses oftentimes to drive us towards himself. So the next time you're in a crisis or you're facing a tough obstacle, just say, wait a minute, this might be something that God's allowing into my life for a greater good. Life storms can be change agents that bring us closer to Christ. But that's what the enemy wants to do is he kind of wants to come in and make us think that God isn't there, that God doesn't love us as much as he used to, or we've done something wrong. Hey, sometimes things come into our lives because we open the door and invite them. There's a lot of young people in this room. Believe me, I, when I ministered with college and career and singles for 13 years, one of the things I remembered is they would start in a relationship with someone that they knew they shouldn't have, ended up getting hurt, and then they're wondering, why did God do this to me? I mean, there are some times in life where we open the door and invite something in that's going to wreck our life. It's going to be a tough obstacle. But then there are other times that it just won't make sense. So we may not have a faith problem. We may just simply have a hope problem. And I'm the representative, I'm the hope dealer today to say to you that there are some ways that we can maximize what God's word says to us when it relates to hope. I want to share three pictures with you real quick. Because as they say, a picture is worth a thousand what? <clears throat> Good, you guys are fading a little bit, got to keep you going. This first picture is of my daughter, Tori. <clears throat> this all happened when we were at this church. We, uh, she was born with a hole in the heart. And that's a picture of her post-surgery. And her heart was about the size of my thumbnail, okay? And that hole was so small that the doctor that did the surgery patched it with a Kevlar patch with 120 stitches on a heart that size. I've had other heart surgeon friends at other churches I've served at, and they said, Rick, that's phenomenal. That's like cutting-edge stuff. We had to wait to six months to get her there. We were serving at this church when that happened. So imagine as a parent, you know, you, you get married, you find that special someone, you're having your kids, and then you're, one of your children are born with a hole in the heart, and the doctor says, we got to get them to six months of age just to have the surgery. And in between that time period of birth and six months of age, she codes twice and almost dies. Imagine while you're going through that, this next picture is of our son. We fast forward just, a, a, just weeks after our daughter had her surgery, and we're all in the hospital room for our son, Chad. And, and as we're sitting there, Tori that had that heart surgery is right there. And then that little guy sitting on Gina, my wife's lap, is looking at his big brother. Because his big brother, Chad, had always wanted a little brother. Now, young men and women in this room, you're, you're, you're praying, you're wondering, where is that special someone for me? What it's going to be like? When you're going to have a family? And all of a sudden, something comes in. And man, when it, when it messes with your kids, that's a different story. See, that picture you just saw a moment ago of our son in his bed, just days before that, we had to tell him that it was okay to let go, that he was going to die. Now imagine just for a moment a cancer specialist coming into you and saying, Mr. and Mrs. Pugh, you have to tell your son it's okay to let go and die. Where would your hope meter be? Has God failed you? Has God let you down? Has God dropped the ball? Dear friend, I'm here to tell you no, no, and no. Who is to say that if I never entered into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, that that wouldn't have happened anyway? You know, bad stuff happens to people that know God, and bad stuff happens to people that don't know God. Dear friend, I just want to tell you, I don't know what it would be like to go through something like that without knowing a good and holy God and being at a good church that loves people. And that's an amen right there. So when you think about all these pictures, I've just got one last one for you, and that's the biggest pain in the neck I've got. Now, I know you're getting ahead of me. You're thinking, who could that be sitting down somewhere where I was sitting? No, it's in my neck. Check out this x-ray picture of my neck. Football injuries, wrestling, weightlifting, car accidents. I got enough metal in my neck right now to build a frying pan if I wanted to. <clears throat> about two years ago, I had to step down from an awesome church kind of like this, people that just love people. It was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. My pain level was so great by about 10, 30, or 11 o'clock in the morning, I just, it was done. I was tapping out. And I said, you know what? I've got to go get fixed. And it was just like God himself pulled me aside and said, you know what? Every once in a while, you've got to take care of yourself, and we're going to get you fixed. 
Two months ago, after going to Mayo for five months, Mayo Clinic and Spine Institute, couldn't do anything, I went to a stem cell specialist up in St. Augustine. Two months ago, they started stem cell procedures on me, and now I'm back up to about 78%. Now, here's what I want you to hear. If I would have given up on my hope in Christ, I could have sat back and had a pity party. You know the bad thing about pity parties? Nobody shows up and you don't get any presents. They're no fun. But what I did is I recognized and realized some things that were very, very important. Hebrews 6.19 says this. We have this, what's the word? Hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Verse 20, where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become our high priest forever. Now think about this for a moment. Um, let, me, let me just, I'm going to come down here just for a moment. And you guys, you're a real sharp crowd, so you're going to tell me what this is, right? What is that? It's an anchor. Good job. Middle row on, on the ball here. So I need somebody to help me here. Because what I need you to do is just take this rope and just kind of spread it out along the front down there, okay? Thank you. All right, thank you. That's my daughter, Tori, who you saw in the picture earlier in that little bed, all right? So you can just lay it there. Tori, 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 just lay it there. Tori, Tori, just lay the rope down. Tori, just lay the rope down. You got it. Thank you very much. See, we should have rehearsed that. This is where it's live in Memorex, folks. So here's what I want you to realize. When the Scripture says that we have this hope as an anchor, we think of anchors as something negative. Haven't you ever been told, guys, the person's an anchor. That situation's an anchor. Cut it loose. Get rid of it. It's keeping you from going where you need to go. This passage of Scripture is saying this. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, and it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. See, the anchor that we have is not just some fictitious thing. The anchor is literally Jesus Christ himself. Now, catch this. There's something connected to that anchor that's connected to each one of us as a child of God, and it's important. Once you realize that, that can change the way you look at any situation you'll ever face in life. But don't make the mistake that my cousin did. My cousin, who I won't mention because he, he might hear this, um, this was before my time. They were all out, and they were going to go lobstering. So they're out on this boat, and my uncle, my dad's brother, who my dad's here this morning, my uncle tells his son to throw the anchor in so they can kind of tie off and go catch some lobsters and get, you know, anybody like lobsters in this place? All right, good. What's the best way to eat lobster? Some butter. Some sauce. Is there a good seafood place around here anywhere anybody know about? Getting hungry already, right? So he said, his dad said, throw the anchor in. So guess what he did? He took that anchor and he threw it in the water. Problem. Guess what? It wasn't secured to anything. Now, how often do you and I go through life when something hits us head on? Yes, thank you for that. I hear that. Exactly. And we toss the anchor out, and it's like we, we're not connected. The next time you get the phone call, I'll never forget, I was on staff here, and I was at the car dealership getting something taken care of for the car, and the phone rings, and it's the doctor's office telling us that our son had relapsed with his cancer. Anybody ever felt like they've been sucker punched before? And you're a child of God, and you're like, where did this come from? What's the perspective? How do we put it into perspective? I mean, it doesn't have to be something physical. It can be a relationship issue. Your heart's been broken. It can be a financial issue. Your bank account's been broken. It could be a spiritual issue. Whatever it may be, perspective matters. One of the things we did here when I was serving as college pastor, we did this thing called Fear Factor. And uh, we, we, there was a bunch of us. Some of us are here today. I see Chip back there and, and others. We went out to uh, Coco, and we jumped out of a perfectly good plane. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you, but to me, that was a big deal. Because I, I, I'm scared of heights. I don't like heights. I mean, I'm, I'm okay around six feet. But when you get much higher than that, I don't like it very much. So when you get into a plane and it starts taking you up and you're getting up to about 15,000 feet and you're over at Cocoa Beach and you see the vehicle assembly building, you know where they do the rockets and everything, and that thing looks about that big. <clears throat> yeah, you start to go, oh, no. And then the guy starts edging you towards the side of the airplane, and they're like, guess what? You're up next. And, man, you start speaking in tongues. You start doing all kinds of stuff. And I, and I, I don't sell Pastor Dwayne I said that, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just playing around. 
And you start hoping, oh my goodness gracious. And then when you leave that plane, it's on. Perspective matters. Because see, here's one thing that we have to understand. When something hits us, a tough obstacle comes into our life, and we may not feel very hopeful at that exact moment. We've got some things we can rely upon. Perspective matters. God has a greater perspective than 15,000 feet. He's got a perspective that, that transcends all of that. Because that's the kind of God that we serve. So I want to share with you three perspectives that will help you overcome life's toughest obstacles. The first one is this, to know him. To know him. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we all we know in all things God works together for the good of those that, what? Love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, here's the thing. Um, I think it's in John chapter 8. It says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you, what? Free. free. So in order for the truth to set you free, what has to happen? You have to know it. I'm not talking about an intellectual knowledge. The devil himself has that. I'm talking about that great 18-inch trip from the head to the heart where you know God and that he's too good to ever do uh, bad and he's always right and can't do wrong. I mean, that's the reality. When we begin to know that God is for us, that he proved it on the cross, I mean, we nail that down. Not only this, why do we gather on Sundays to worship? I mean, let's just be honest. Do you ever drive, get ready for work, and you, you see your neighbors outside, and, and they're weeding and mowing the grass? You're like, I'd rather go to church than that. Who wouldn't? But then when you drive by the beach or you drive by the parks, then you start to scratch your head and say, I don't know. No, yeah, thank you. Feel that too. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We get the privilege of coming to church to worship a God that transforms and transcends time, space, and matter. Think about that for a moment. You say, what? This is a God that lives in a realm beyond time that we're bound by and we live in, space and matter. You say, how do you know that? Genesis 1. In beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, time, space, and matter. He transcends it. He transforms it. That means he's not bound by anything that we think of. That we know his perspective is different from ours. So the next time an obstacle comes our way and we think, man, do I have a faith problem here? Have I done something wrong? No, maybe it's just that we have a hope problem and we need to remember the first principle in overcoming a hope problem is knowing that God is good and he is good what? All the time. Now let me tell you something. When the doctor told us our daughter had a hole in the heart and if we didn't get her to six months of age, we'd have a problem. When I'm at seminary and my son is diagnosed with leukemia, when I'm serving at this church and they call and say it's relapsed, when I step down from a church I love greatly to work on neck and back issues, anybody tracking with me? There are times in our life where we might just say, oh man. But we have to step back and rest upon the reality that we know that in all things God is working together for the good. Now don't miss this. Because sometimes in our culture, we're so fixated on ourselves that we forget that it's not just about me or you. That in other words, when Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose, that's conformity to the image of Christ. All things means all things work together for the good for me, for you, for you, for you. You ever thought about that? That God is so awesome that he's not only working together the good for my life, but he's working it together for my wife, for my friends, for my church family. He's working it all together for the good. And we have to know that. The second principle is this, the principle of trusting him. The one thing that my wife and I and our family had to rely on is this. If you can't trace his hand, you can always trust his heart. You have to. The Bible says that God is love. I want you to turn to the neighbor on your left and right and say, you are loved. Do it right now. Oh, I, that sounded a little disingenuous. It's kind of like, oh, I love you. You remember those days when you were dating and you were thinking, who's going to be the first one to say, I love you? Or you hang up the phone and you're like, I love you. Yeah, hang up. All right, I think he said, I, I, what was that? I, I love you. You know, you're like one of those things. No. 
When you can't trace his hand, you can always trust his heart and God's love. Listen, one of the things I realized is when I heard a quote from Michelangelo, and he says, when I look at a big block of rock, I see an angel inside of it, and I start chipping away to set it free. And I think about, what does that mean for me and for you? When God saves us, and the, the catalyst, our salvation, is simply that, that which brings us, the, it's the springboard for him conforming us into the image of Christ. How much chipping away is there needed in my life and your life? I'd say a lot. The second principle is to trust him. Trusting requires giving up control. Any of you remember that song now? It's old, but Jesus Take the Wheel by Carrie Underwood. Yeah, Jesus Take the Wheel. Um, one of the things that I find interesting about that song is, you know, it's kind of one of those songs, you're not going to get it out of your mind now if you start singing it and you're gonna, it's until the next song comes along. But what's interesting about that song is, to me, that song is kind of one of those deals where you're in trouble, and at that moment you're saying, oh, Jesus, please take the wheel. I, I, I'll give up control. What if we were to give up control before the crisis? What if we were to say, Jesus, take the wheel of my life right now? And when we know that he's got the wheel, he's got control of every direction of my life, guess what? He does anyway, right? Right? All of a sudden, we begin to realize not only do we know him, but we can trust him because he's got it all figured out. So we can know him, we can trust him, but then the third and final principle I want to share with you is this. It's the principle to stand with him. Stand with him. Listen to this passage of scripture out of Psalm 40, verse 2. It says this, he lifted me out of a slimy pit. Out of the mud and mire, he set my feet on a what? What's the word? A rock, and gave me a firm place to stand. Now, does that kind of sound like somebody else maybe that Jesus spoke about? So that was Psalm 40. Does that start to sound a little bit like somebody that you may remember, a prodigal son, I think it was, that when he was finally in that muddy pit with the pig slop and everything else, and all of a sudden he realized, what am I doing here? What was the point of realization? Because there's a point of realization where God will reach us, and it's kind of like that aha moment. I want to share this with you, and it's, it's um, I don't want it to sound, you know, weird. Because whenever you try to convey a story that you feel God has revealed to you that's for you, it, it has the potential of sounding, you know, like weird. But over the last two years as I've been working on rehabbing and doing you know, my back and neck and all this stuff, and then the stem cell therapy two months ago, I was just saying, God, you know, why two years? I mean, can we just all get honest at church? Is that okay? Can we just open our hearts and be transparent at church? I ask question, you answer question. Very good, thank you guys. All right, good. So let's, let's just kind of put all pretense aside for a moment. Even pastors have problems. Everybody, it's common to man. So I was just in my devotion time and quiet time, I was just saying, Lord, you know, why? Why, why all this? I mean, I, I know you, and, and I trust you, and I, I'm standing with you, but, but what, what? What's going on? And I'm telling you, there was no audible voice, but there was just scripture that I was going through. And it was, it was as simple, it seemed as sure as the Spirit of God was just saying, you know, son, one of the things I call pastors to be are under-shepherds. And an under-shepherd's job is to not only feed the flock, but to help protect the flock from bad doctrine, bad theology, all the stuff that can infiltrate a church to keep a church healthy and unified, right? And as he's saying this, it kind of reminded me of a sheepdog. And as I was just praying with the Lord, as we were interacting and, and reading through the scripture, I said, I I'm kind of getting it. And he says, son, you needed time to heal. And one of the things I've never forgotten is when I was serving at this church shortly after our son passed away from leukemia, I was speaking in an event out at UCF. And I'll never forget speaking to that crowd of students, and man, I just lost it. Just lost it. It's kind of one of those moments you just break down. And I realized in the moment that I broke down, God filled me up. I believe that's what God's waiting on. He's waiting on a lot of us to stop playing the game and say, you know what? When I get real with God, God will get way more real with me. So not only do I know that God is for me and he's with me, not only do I trust him, 
but I realized that he picked me up out of a slimy, muddy pit and put my feet upon a rock. None other than his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you understand where your place is to stand, the imagery will pop time and time again, no matter what the storm. You remember the passage out of John chapter 14, the first four verses or so? It, it says, um, uh, it, do not let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many rooms or mansions. You believe in God, believe also in me. What's interesting about that is you read beforehand and following that verse, what you begin to see is the importance of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. So here's what I want to do today. I believe if Pastor Dwayne told me correctly, you all just finished a series that had to do with actions speak louder than words. So I want to give you an opportunity this morning, just like we did in the first hour. This anchor that I brought up here is symbolic of that Hebrews passage, the, this hope that we have that is Christ Jesus himself. But the problem that many of us have had is we've t we tend to throw the anchor overboard without the connector, and the connector is the Holy Spirit. So what I want to do is I'm going to invite, in just a moment, I'm going to invite my wife up here. And I'm going to invite any of you in this room that are dealing with a personal, a financial, a spiritual, whatever it is, and you're just feeling, I need hope. I need hope right now. I'm going to invite you to take a step for hope and grab a hold of this rope and stretch it out across this room, and we're going to pray together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the Spirit of God to fill your life with hope like you've never experienced before. Would you stand with me? Let's stand together. Father, I'm going to ask that through this room right now, you would send your Holy Spirit and you would do something in each and every person's life like you've never done before. Father, too many times we ask you to show up and not often enough ask you to show off. And Father, I believe there are times in our lives where we're needing to say, God, I need you not only to show up, but to show off in my life. So, Father, I pray that right now as people start coming, right now, to grab a hold of this rope as a symbolic gesture of your Holy Spirit, that, God, you would meet them at their greatest point. And I'm going to ask you, standing around other people, just start praying for people. Just start praying for people. You want to grab a hold of the rope, stretch it out. All along the front. Oftentimes, God will meet us when we take that step. You study the scripture, you see it time and time again. When someone took that first step, Jesus took the others. So no matter what it is, anything at all, let this be a time between you and God. You're watching online, you're watching on Facebook Live, you're watching on the Good Life channel. You can kind of just feel like you're here with us. As people are coming from all the back, side over here. If you can't reach the rope, I'm going to ask you just to put your hand on someone's shoulder. You know, we come to church every day and we're praying, God, speak to me, touch my life. And each Sunday is different. But you don't know what God's doing in the life of someone standing next to you right now. And this could be a breakthrough moment for them. So I'm going to ask you, be in a spirit of prayer right now. Let's pray together. Father God, as we get ready to celebrate the greatest event in human history, I want to thank you that you are our hope, and this hope that we have in you is all that we need for overcoming life's toughest obstacles, no matter what they are. God, I thank you for the perspective you give us. God, that you love us, that we can trust you, we can know you, and we can stand with you because you put us right by your side as your children. So help us to embrace the hold that you have on us through the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for times that we've let go of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, that we've been, we've been drowned, nearly drowned by the circumstances because we don't have the right perspective. God, for each person watching this online or on TV or down here holding this rope, I pray that right now you would fill them with hope like they've never experienced before. And Father, we're going to leave this place giving you all the glory and all the thanks and all the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.